Hi there, and welcome to La Terrasse. I'm Christopher Watkin, author, university lecturer, and researcher in modern and contemporary European philosophy. And this is the gas from La Terrasse. It's your open invitation to pull up a chair, order yourself your favorite drink, and think together with me about life, culture, and French philosophy. This episode is an audio version of a blog post that I wrote on March the 22nd this year. It was the fourth in a series of reflections on the COVID-19 pandemic in the light of Albert Camus' The Play, which I reread recently. The post is called Pandemic Temporality, The Strange Times of COVID-19. I hope you enjoy it. A pandemic does strange things to time. We're used to living in different times at once. There's the clock time of regular 60 second minutes and 24 hour days. There's the joy of youthful infatuation when a day with your beloved passes like a fleeting breath. And there's the dull, interminable drag of the watched pot. But a pandemic subjects us to new ways of experiencing time, ways that overshadow and replace our normal rhythms. Camus relates many of these in a way that helps us to see what exactly it is that we're currently living through in the COVID-19 pandemic. In this post, uh, I want to just discuss two of these pandemic temporalities that have struck me uh, as I've been watching and listening to the media. Uh, and reading La Peste over the past few days. First, there are the new temporal markers. We're accustomed to dividing time in two, usually in Western traditions around the birth of Christ. But come the pandemic, uh, the division in time that most preoccupies us is no longer BC AD or BCE CE, but before and since the outbreak, BC before coronavirus. In fact, these temporal incisions take on biblical proportions, tapping out the creation, fall, redemption rhythm of a pandemic biblical theology, if you like. The ubiquitous proclamations currently in circulation, insisting that things can never and should never be the same again, see Naomi Klein's recent coronavirus capitalism as one example, follow the pattern of theological claims about the incarnation driving an inexpungible transcendent incision into the smooth flow of history. They frame the virus as an event in the strong philosophical sense of that term, a disruptive insurgent moment that leaves the situation in which it erupts irrevocably transformed. The times before we heard of COVID-19 now take on in our memories the, the halcyon focus of youthful naivety. They strive, strike us as Edenic, prelapsarian, a time when despite all our cynicism and complaining, a belief in the basic stability of our fundamental institutions and way of life was still quite quaintly the norm. Those were days when, despite everything, we could still go to the pub or visit a restaurant, shock horror, when elderly relatives <laughs> didn't see us as an existential threat, when our imaginations were not aching with images of columns of army trucks filling the streets of picturesque Italian towns, loaded down with coffins too many for local crematoriums to process. Even our most bitter rantings from those times strike us now as so many songs of innocence. As for naming the period when the pandemic will have receded, in the past week I've heard it called the aftertime, a, a term that's dripping with both heavenly and eschatological hope and with post-apocalyptic trauma. And this viral eschaton is brought home to the imagination by the speculative timetables in terms of which it's presented to us. It will, in Boris Johnson's quaint anthropomorphism, 
be 12 weeks before we, quote, send the virus packing. And the perusia of a vaccine flickers dimly on the horizon for those with the eyes to see and the faith to believe in its redemptive advent. Secondly, pandemics ruthlessly recode common temporal markers. And this, for my money, is one of Camus' masterstrokes in La Peste, an experience that he renders with an exquisite lightness of touch that's only possible in works of fiction, really, and that, that underlines once again, were it needed, why the arts have a central role to play in helping us understand and come to terms with and respond to this pandemic. So let us take one temporal marker then and, and follow its transformation in the pages of La Peste. Camus leads his reader on a painful journey in which the common associations of spring, the season of spring, are stripped away as it takes on a new symbolic meaning for the inhabitants of Oran. The onset of spring before the plague is a pleasant, natural, delicate event in the dreamy Algerian city, as Camus writes. Le changement des saisons ne s'y lit que dans le ciel. Le printemps s'annonce seulement par la qualité de l'air ou par les corbeilles de fleurs que le, le petit vendeur ramène des bons lieux. C'est un printemps qu'on vend sur les marchés. In the translation, the seasons are discriminated only in the sky. All that tells you of spring's coming is the feel of the air or the baskets of flowers brought in from the suburbs by peddlers. It's spring cried out in the marketplaces. And this baseline, serves then only to render the transvaluation of spring in the novel all the more painful. We're given the first subtle hint of this impending recoding only two pages later when Camus writes Rien ne pouvait faire espérer à nos concitoyens les incidents qui se produisirent au temps de cette année-là et qui furent, nous le comprimes ensuite, comme les premiers signes la série des graves événements dont on s'est proposé de faire ici la chronique. Our fellow citizens had not the faintest reason to apprehend the incidents that took place in the spring of the year in question and were, as we subsequently realised, premonitions of the grave events we are to chronicle. Camus also informs us in passing that Taru, the chronicler of the plague, appears in the early spring in the city of Aron, an incidental detail that gains portentous significance in retrospect. The aggressive recoding of spring begins in earnest, however, with the death of the concierge. Uh, Camus' description of the vernal weather making it complicit, almost, in the mounting claustrophobia and deathliness of the city. He writes, Au lendemain de la mort du concierge, les grandes brumes couvrirent le ciel. Des pluies diluviennes et brèves s'abattirent sur la ville. Une chaleur orageuse suivit ces brusques ondées. La mer elle-même avait perdu son bleu profond et, sous le ciel brumeux, elle prenait des éclats d'argent ou de fer, douloureux pour la vue. La chaleur humide de ce printemps faisait souhaiter les ardeurs de l'été. Dans la ville, bâtie en escargot sur son plateau, à peine ouverte vers la mer, une torpeur morne régnait. Au milieu de ces longs murs crépis, parmi les rues aux victimes poudreuses, dans les tramways d'une jaune salle, on se sentait un peu prisonnier du ciel. Seul le vieux malade de rieux, triomphé de son asthme, peut se réjouir de ce temps. The translation of that quote is on the day following old Michel's death, the sky clouded up and there were brief torrential downpours, each of which was followed by some hours of muggy heat. The aspect of the sea, too, changed. Its dark blue translucency had gone and under the lowering sky it had steely or silvery glints that hurt the eyes to look at. 
The damp heat of the spring made everyone long for the coming of the dry, clean summer heat. On the town, humped snail-wise on its plateau and shut off almost everywhere from the sea, a mood of listlessness descended. Hemmed in by lines and lines of whitewashed walls, walking between rows of dusty shops or riding in the dingy yellow streetcars, you felt, as it were, trapped by the climate. This, however, was not the case with Ria's old Spanish patient, who welcomed this weather with enthusiasm. And so what we can see here is an overcoding of the usual symbolism of spring with new meanings, new portentous meanings. And the overcoding of the now archaic pre-infection symbolism of spring with this new set of not AD but AP, Anno Pestilentiae, meanings, is pressed further when Camus explicitly juxtaposes the season to the plague with which it is now inextricably associated. He writes, Le docteur regardait toujours par la fenêtre. D'un côté la vitre, le ciel frais du printemps. Et de l'autre côté, le mot qui résonnait encore dans la pièce, la peste. Le mot ne contenait pas seulement ce que la science voulait bien y mettre, mais une longue suite d'images extraordinaires qui ne s'accordaient pas avec cette ville jaune et grise, modérément animée à cette heure, bordonnante plutôt que bruyante, heureuse en son, et s'il est possible qu'on puisse être à la fois heureux et morne. The doctor was still looking out of the window. Beyond it lay the tranquil radiance of a cool spring sky. Inside the room, a word was echoing still, the word plague. A word that conjured up in the doctor's mind not only what science chose to put into it, but a whole series of fantastic possibilities utterly out of keeping with the grey and yellow town under his eyes, from which were rising the sounds of mild activity characteristic of the hour, a drone rather than a bustling, the noises of a happy town. In short, if it's possible to be at once so dull and happy. And then later, with the precision of a surgeon removing the last trace of a former vernal associations, Camus reintroduces us to the quintessential symbol of spring introduced in the novel's opening pages, those corbeilles de fleurs que de petits vendeurs ramènent des bons lieux, the baskets of flowers brought in from the suburbs by peddlers. The plague has not only overcoded their meaning, we find now on page 76 that it has destroyed their beauty. Pendant ce temps, et de toutes les bons lieux environnantes, le printemps arrivé sur les marchés. Des milliers de roses se fanaient dans les corbeilles de marchands, au long des trottoirs, et leur odeur sucrée flottait dans toute la ville. Meanwhile, from the outlying districts, spring was making its progress into the town. Thousands of roses wilted in the flower vendors' baskets in the marketplaces and along the streets, and the air was heavy with their cloying perfume. But there's a sense in which, in reading the novel, I have to admit that I, I've spoken too quickly in this post. The plague has not exactly destroyed the beauty of these flowers, but it, it has more transformed how the narrator experiences them. Camus is at pains to make it clear that it's not that the roses that are usually strong and healthy are this spring exceptionally wilting and malodorous. Indeed, apparemment, rien n'était changé. Outwardly, this spring was like any other. Now, what's different is the mise en scène of these annual events, the way in which they're understood and experienced by the narrative voice, and therefore, by extension, by the people of Oron. It is once more a case of the same events being recoded, not of their being replaced by new realities. And yet, this recoding is everything. The old, expectant, vivifying spring has wilted and died. 
leaving in its place a new suffocating, stinking experience drawn from its unchanged events. This is a spring that ends not with the bang of a vibrant summer, but with the whimper of decaying exhaustion. As Camus writes, On voyait clairement que le printemps s'était exténué, qu'il s'était prodigué dans des milliers de fleurs éclatant partout à la ronde et qu'il allait maintenant s'assoupir, s'écraser lentement sous la double pesée de la peste et de la chaleur. It was a pain to see that spring had spent itself, lavished its ardour on the myriads of flowers that were bursting everywhere into bloom, and now was being crushed by the twofold onslaught of heat and plague. So then what temporal markers is COVID-19 recoding? It is, as I write this, as I speak now, too early to tell, really. Perhaps the European Football Championships and the Olympic Games, if they're shifted to odd-numbered years, uh, will remain as a visible scar tissue of a former trauma. There'll no doubt be anniversaries, national peak infection days, standing as each country's quote-unquote darkest hour. Perhaps there'll even be a VE Day victory over the epidemic. In a future post, I hope to return to pandemic time in order to discuss the temporalities left untreated here. The 14-day quarantine period, for example. The average number of days from infection to death or cure as well as the way in which these recoded temporalities contribute to what we might call a being towards virus, a new global mode of inhabiting the world that forces itself upon us in what everyone has agreed are these quite exceptional times. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Gas from La Terrasse. You can head over to iTunes, Google Play or Spotify to subscribe or rate or leave a review. You can also find more content related to my research, writing and blogging over at ChristopherWatkin.com. Until next time, take care.